Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Uh, so there is a new video on new Unearthed Arcana that is going to be our, the first Unearthed Arcana we've had for the revised Player's Handbook that's coming out in 2024. This is on character origins and there is a video and I decided I was going to do a reaction to it. So here it is. We have a new Unearthed Arcana, but this is a big one. This has to do with the Player's Handbook that is coming out in a couple of years. So let's, well, where do we begin? We, we begin with origins, right? Appropriately enough, we begin at the beginning. And so this Unearthed Arcana is the first in what's going to be a series of Unearthed Arcana articles that come out every month or so over the course of not only the next year, but probably the next year and a half or so. Okay, so we're going to be getting new playtest material, uh, it sounds like, pretty much every month. So that's pretty cool. Where we're going to present different pieces of the player's handbook, but with brand new content, then also familiar content, but with new elements, updates. And this is the chance for D&D fans to let us know what they think, to really lend their voice to the chorus of D&D fans that will be really letting us know where they want us to go next with this game that many of us have been playing for decades and so many people have been playing since the 5th edition Player's Handbook came out in 2014. And so with this first one, we thought, why not start at the start? And that is, uh, figuring out where your character in D&D, where did they come from? And so when we say your character origin, that's what we're talking about. What in your backstory helped shape who? Okay, so obviously origins are going to be the replacement for backgrounds. Uh, so backgrounds, I guess, will be called origins when we get to the new player's handbook. By the way, uh, I watched a live stream from Wizards Presents today. Uh, and they announced that the playtest is currently available on D&D Beyond. I went there and it was not available yet. It, they said it will be available at 12 p.m. Pacific time. So by the time I get this video up, I imagine it will be either available or very soon available. Uh, so if you want to check these out, and I will definitely want to check these out, then you should be able to uh, today. And uh, they also mentioned on that live stream, by the way, that it's not just the player's handbook they're revising. They are also revising the monster manual and the dungeon master's guide. And the way I read that, or the way I heard that, it would suggest to me that uh, they're all going to be coming out relatively around the same time. Who you are and was formative for you before you became an adventurer. Your adventuring life is largely expressed by your character class. And so character classes we'll get to in some upcoming Unearthed Arcana articles. I'm looking forward in to that. In this one, we're going to be looking at three main elements that together express who you were in the earliest stages of your life. And that is your character's race, your character's background, as well as whatever feat that you get as part of that background. Because yes. Okay, so... Uh, I was apparently incorrect. It's not just a replacement for backgrounds, but they're kind of combining. It sounds like the, your race along with your background and a free feat, which is not really a surprise because we've seen uh, in the last couple uh, official releases that backgrounds have always now been tied to a feat. So that's going to be universal, which is good because it's not good to have some backgrounds give you a feat and some don't. One of the new things here, which some of our recent D&D books have already signaled was coming, yeah. and many yeah. fans have already guessed coming, that everyone's background will now give them a first level feat. But we'll talk more about feats, I think, a little later in the video. So to begin, since this is about origins, let's start with race. So your character's race in D&D represents your ancestry in many ways. When you make your character, you decide, are, is your character a member of the human race or one of the game's fantastical races? 
Various race options have appeared in many of our books over the last eight years. Now is our time in this Unearthed Arcana to revisit our old friends, the races that are in the player's handbook. And so here we're going to be able Which to need look updated. at all of us together as D&D fans, the latest versions of humans, elves, dwarves, and others. Many familiar aspects of those races are still here. Uh, many of the traits that people have been using for the last eight years, they're right here on the page. But then there are also new traits. And some of those traits that we've been all using in our characters have new options. Great example of this. In the dwarf, you still have stone cunning. But now, a dwarf, as long as they're in contact with stone in some way, whether they're standing on it, touching it, Dwarves now, a certain number of times per day, can give themselves tremor sense, meaning they can Ooh. sense through the earth itself. That's if really there cool. Are creatures nearby, moving objects. We're really leaning into the mythic stories of each of the race. And what I like about that is stone cutting is largely just what we call a ribbon feature. In other words, it's not all that mechanically powerful. Adding a tremor sense that, should I guess, proficiency bonus times for long rest? Um, anyway, adding that I think is really cool. I mean, it takes a feature that is basically forgettable and then gives something really nice on top of that. So I would love to see that happen with all the player's handbook races. It's options in the game and looking for ways to make them sort of the version truest to themselves. Like right. some, something that we would talk about while working on them is we want this dwarf to be the dwarfiest dwarf. Right, right, right. We right. want the elf to be the elfiest elf. And so we've been looking at ways of not only maintaining continuity with, with what sort of the general silhouette of that race option is in the 2014 Player's Handbook, but again, bring some new elements to the foreground give you some more fun things that you'll be able to do during play. So that's another element. People are going to see in the races that ones that maybe in the past didn't have an active ability, something they could do during play, now they're, they might have one. And so the dwarf's tremor sense is an example of this. Now the dwarf has something that they can use that makes them feel dwarfy and will have usefulness in adventures uh, while also having some of the familiar traits that they had before. Their resistance to poison, for instance. Right. Still here. I love the narrative hook of that just because if you're a miner, if you are a tunnel digger like in a war, you are extremely sensitive to vibrations. Yes. <laughs> you're just ultra aware all the time. So that's that's perfect for that uh, playable race. It, exactly. And... Uh, you will get to see things like that uh, in all of them, where we took something that was there before, and often it's just we turned up the volume. What can we do to this to make it even more fun? Uh, give a new dimension of play for people as they play their dwarf, their halfling, their gnome, uh, what have you. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are also options where before there were none. One example I'm really excited about is uh, if you play a tiefling, uh, you now have several really interesting choices. Choices that we began exploring years ago in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. So he's talking about the variant races. Uh, so with the tiefling, there were um, variants based on uh, like which devil you, I guess, type you uh, came from, and you would get. Uh, different spells instead of the standard tiefling spells and such uh, by choosing a different variant. Uh, so he's suggesting that uh, that is going to be something they expand on in the new Player's Handbook. And it will be Player's Handbook material, so this will be core rules. Mm -hmm. And now lean into here in the, the this UA for the Player's Handbook, and that is when you create a tiefling, you decide what your infernal legacy is. I'm sorry, your fiendish legacy. Uh, and one of those options is infernal, but your legacy also might be abyssal. Or uh, a, a new third 
third option, which we're calling chthonic, which has to do, each of these options has to do with different lower planes. And so infernal means you come, your, your legacy is connected to lawful evil planes. If you pick chthonic, it's neutral evil planes. And if you pick abyssal, chaotic evil planes. Now, of course, the tiefling's moral outlook is, is not connected yeah. to the sort of origin of their mystical powers, which are shaped, those powers, by this choice. So if you want the tiefling you have already in the 2014 Player's Handbook, choose the Infernal Legacy, and you're going to see you have the familiar abilities, although you have a little more now. Uh, because now, in addition to the magical abilities you had before, uh, you now also have the Firebolt cantrip. Uh, because right. you know, you're know you going to be able to hurl fire uh, thanks to the legacy that you have. Because that's very much the, 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 the fire and the, the, the pits and the flames are basically <laughs> what evokes that type of uh, 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 setting for anything infernal. Exactly. Whereas if you pick Abyssal, you have a completely different set of spells that you that you have in you innately uh, and then also your damage resistance is different so infernal tieflings have the resistance to fire that tieflings have in the 2014 player's handbook whereas abyssal uh, and chthonic tieflings have other damage resistances this sort of structure of giving you choices that maybe you didn't have before is something you'll see in a variety of places, not only in this Unearthed Arcana, but in future ones as well. Now, there's another fun choice that tieflings will have that they didn't have before, and it's also a choice that humans have in this Unearthed Arcana, and that is their size. If you are a human or a tiefling, you're now going to be able to decide whether you are medium, as they are in the 2014 Player's Handbook, or small. Uh, because first off, in the real world, there are humans who are small. And so we want to make sure that's now an option in the game as well. And when it comes to tieflings, we added that option because some of the game's iconic fiends are actually quite little. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we thought, how fun would it be to see more height variants in right. tieflings? A theme then that we carry over into a brand new race uh, that is mm -hmm. also in this Arnacht Arcana. Uh, would you like to talk about this? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, they, these are very unique. Yes, so in this Arnacht Arcana, we introduce a race that we're calling the Ardlings. Ardlings are also a people of the Outer Plains, like Tieflings, and like Asamar, who appear in Monsters of the Multiverse. And Ardlings are associated with three different groups of upper planes. You'll see there's a parallelism here. Tieflings mm -hmm. are associated with sort of three, th the three main segments of the lower planes. Ardlings are associated with the three main segments of the upper planes. So that to me sounds very similar to the Asimar, at least in theme. Um, so I'll be interested to see how the mechanics vary. They can be small or medium, just like tieflings, and all of their abilities are themed around, you know, the heavens and whatnot. But also visually, they are really going to stand out because one thing that sets Ardlings apart from, say, their Asimar cousins is they all have uh, the, the face of an animal. Oh. And what we're doing oh, here that's is cool. really leaning into the fact that going all the way back to first edition, Many of the game's celestials don't actually look like angels. Many of the game's celestials from the game's long history, and I'm thinking here of Gardinals, Hound Archons, mm -hmm. uh, many of the avatars of specific gods, many gods themselves in not only D&D's pantheons, but, but general what, mythology. Yes, but yeah. also in, in human mythology have the visages of animals. And so that that is true of the Ardlings, where when you make one of these folk who can trace their lineages to the upper planes, you also decide uh, what 
animal appearance you have, so whether you know you're a bear or a lion or so a we cat finally get our dog or an character. eagle. Uh, that that is going to make it so that when when you're walking down the street, people are going to know there's something special about you, <laughs> especially when you then also temporarily sprout your spectral wings uh, to go on short short little bouts of flight. So this will also be the first time that we have introduced a, a race with limited flight right. in the player's handbook. Right, and we, we saw that in a, a previous U, UA as well. But yeah, this limited flight, because flight can, flight is an interesting thing. <laughs> yes, and, and, and this flight definitely is just for little bouts because uh, the Ardlings do not. And uh, personally, I have mixed feelings about flight on characters. Um, I think it, depends but certainly when we're at low level sometimes the challenges are just things that flight would just simply bypass so instead of you know helping you deal with the challenge they would just have you not deal with the challenge at all and uh, to me that's it's not what i'm looking for as a dm when i present challenges i'm i'm looking for players to solve them absolutely but uh when they have features that just say oh well this isn't a challenge for me well and that, that's not really the idea I have as a DM. Um, so I'll be interested. They say small bouts of flight. So we'll, we'll see what they mean by that when we look at the Unearthed Arcana, which I will be doing on this channel. Have physical wings mm -hmm. all the time, but they can channel their connection to the upper planes to temporarily have these luminous wings that they use to, you know, maybe reach a, a heart, a, a hard to reach place. I, I like to imagine that you know some of them, especially with their, their animal features, might sometimes just use this ability to get that cat stranded up there in the tree. Uh, and, yeah, nothing nefarious. <laughs> <laughs> right. although, although just as tieflings determine their own moral compasses, this is true of ardlings as well. So uh, just because you know grandma might have been from Mount Celestia, doesn't mean your Ardling uh, shares the moral outlook of that plane. Uh, so you could play a sinister Ardling, uh, and I think uh, it would be quite interesting uh, to see that in, in people's games in the years ahead. Oh yeah, I'm already going to. I, I'm playing a bat Ardling, 100%. <laughs> you have unleashed my, my bat, humanoid bat fantasy already unknowingly so i'm very excited for this and and i can't wait to find out if your bat ardling is uh from the uh exalted heavenly or idyllic oh legacy. wow interesting yeah no that, that that will require some thought yeah and because because just as in the tiefling that choice then uh gives your character different magical abilities themed to the the sort of group of planes that your character's legacy is connected to. So one of the races that is included right from the get is in the player's handbook for 2024, presumably, is the orc. So the orc is another new race for the player's handbook. Are they uh, going to keep half here. orcs in the player's and handbook? People who have monsters of the multiverse will see this orc is the orc from that book. And we've decided that because for many, many years the orc has been playable, it's long past time for the orc to graduate to the player's handbook. Right. Uh, and <laughs> so many people play them. Yes, and and you know take take their place uh, next to uh, this other cast of characters. So I'm excited that uh, orcs are are now going to be there in the game's core rulebook. But man, Tieflings got there first. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we also have backgrounds, and backgrounds have become so much more important than they were before. <laughs> yes, uh, and not only more important, but also more customizable than they've ever been before. And more narrative weight. Yes. Like this is this is an important fact. It's super important about your character. Exactly, um, and this. This emphasis on narrative is something that people will also see uh, glimmers of also back in the race section of the same UA uh, because 
uh, something that we offer to players now officially. This is something people have been doing in their, you know, their games for many years. Uh, in, a, in a sort of story space between your race choice and your background choice, we encourage you to consider the possibility that your character uh, might have parents of different humanoid kinds. Your, one parent might be a dwarf, the other one might be a halfling. One parent might be a human. So, yeah, I was wondering this when he talked about putting orcs as a main race in the player's handbook. Are they still going to have half orcs? Um, and what this makes me think is that things like half elves and half orcs uh, might be replaced by a more customizable uh, way to mix your parentage. And maybe one half isn't human. Um, so uh, that might be really interesting. I think that is something that is long due in the game. Uh, if you're going to have half races, then you kind of need a way to make all the races half races. And the other one might be an orc. Some of these pairings the game has uh, embraced in the past. We're now opening it up so to encourage people to realize many pairings are possible. And when you do it, what you do is you choose one of those, basically you choose the parent that gives your character your game traits, right. but then you can mix together the visual qualities of the two to determine how your character looks. And so you're, you're kind of, you have, you have two options to draw from for the aesthetic of your character, and then again you choose. Okay, so it sounds like um, what he's suggesting here is that instead of having a unique set of mechanics, you're just going to pick the mechanics of one of the races, but then you can aesthetically change them. Choose which one is giving you your special traits, your character's size uh, and speed, that sort of thing. And like you said, players have been doing this so for so long. Like my own wife plays a gnome, half goblin, a noblin. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like, this is very common. You just have to choose the, the stats that you want to go with. Right. Yeah. And, and so, again, another example of us providing uh, new ways of experiencing the game we're all already playing. So now let's go from that <laughs> to then the backgrounds. Yeah, let's get into the backgrounds. And backgrounds are really exciting for me because of how we essentially deconstructed them into their component parts, examined each part, and then reassembled them. And so the first thing that people are going to see is that the default option now for your background is to build your own. In the 2014 Player's Handbook, we had a bunch of backgrounds you could choose from. And then we had a rule that said, if you want to customize a background, here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. We've essentially kind of reversed the priority order, where now the default is build your own background, and we tell you exactly how, or choose one of the sample backgrounds that we provide that were built using the rules that we just gave you for building a background. So what I'm getting here is if the default option is that you are customizing your own background and backgrounds are going to give you a feat, then that suggests to me that we're basically going to get a free feat at level one, which great. I've long since been sold on free feats at level one. Looks like this is just now part of the game and you're not going to have to find the background that has the feet that you want, you're going to make a custom background and you're just going to get a free feet. So I'm all for that. And so what those rules include are some choices for your character that can be very meaningful for you, not only in terms of your character's story, but also in terms of your character's abilities. Because first off, speaking of abilities, uh, one of your choices in background is where you're going to put a floating plus two and a plus one to your ability scores. Mm -hmm. People are already familiar who've been playing d and And I called this one. Uh, I had a previous video where I did some speculation about the 5.5 Player's Handbook, and I said they're going to put ability scores, bonuses off of races, and they're going to put them onto backgrounds. 
And yeah, that sounds like that's exactly what's happening. Uh, with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, as well as some of our other recent books like Monsters of the Multiverse that uh, allow you to have a plus two and a plus one that you decide where they go in your characters. So this is going to feel familiar, but what's different is now that we're working on revising the player's handbook itself, where those bonuses now live uh, in this playtest material is in the background section. And it makes sense because you've been doing this. This is your it, background. This is like the life that you have led. Exactly. This is why you are more dexterous. This is why you have, you're have you stronger because you you lifted great sword. Like, like yes. you were a soldier. You know, this, this kind of equates. Exactly. Because background is all about what have you been doing yeah. for, all, for all the years before you became an adventurer. It, it, it has a, a meaningful effect on your character's stats. And now if you choose one of the pre-made backgrounds, people will see we've, we have chosen what those ability score bonuses are connected to the story of the background. But if you use the default option, which is building your own, just as you can in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, you can put that plus two and that plus one or three plus ones wherever you want, just as you can with Tasha's. But, and the reason why we're doing it sort of both ways, where if you do build your own, you decide where they go, or if you choose a pre-made background, we decide where they go, because we also know there are many players who don't want to have to decide. <laughs> and so if you just like, I pick soldier, Sh soldier tells me yeah. uh, to increase these two stats in this way, and then they're good to go. It's sort of the best of both worlds. Well, and it illustrates the point very well. Yes, and that, and really many of the backgrounds uh, that we provide are really just illustrations of how people can use the new background building uh, system. So ability scores are a part of it. Mm -hmm. You Just as you do now, you uh, in the 2014 Player's Handbook, you'll also get uh, two skill proficiencies, uh, you get a tool proficiency, you get a language, uh, you also get a starting pack. So that's different uh, because with current backgrounds, you get potentially one tool proficiency in one language, but you might get two languages or you might get two tool proficiencies. Sounds like it's automatically one in one now. Package of equipment. And uh, even in our deconstruction and rebuilding process, even all those equipment packages uh, have been examined. Because we're embracing uh, this build your own approach, one of the things we needed to do was make it so that all the backgrounds have equipment packages of the same value. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because in the 2014 Player's Handbook, they didn't. Uh, and right. so now if people like add up how, you know, the cost, they'll see, oh, all the backgrounds have equipment packages worth exactly 50 gold pieces. Um, <laughs> Instead of just going for criminal <laughs> <laughs> or noble. <laughs> right. Right. And uh, one of the main reasons why we've done that is to empower this build your own approach. Yeah. So then the other thing you get in your background, and we touched on it earlier in our talk, and it is, in my mind, the most exciting new piece of background, and that is you also get a first level feat. So in that statement, there are a few things for me to unpack. First off. Now, what he means by first level feat is he talked about this before, and we saw kind of a little bit of it already in uh, um, Strixhaven, is that um, not all feats are available at level one anymore. And sometimes we're going to have stacking feats, where um, one feat is going to have a prerequisite of another feat. Uh, so uh, he obviously the feats are going to be specifically leveled now. So you're a level one feat, uh, kind of like a level one spell. I just talked about a feat and gave it a level. That's critical. Yeah. Because people are <laughs> going to see not only in this Unearthed Arcana, but in the upcoming Unearthed Arcanas over the next year plus, they're going to see feats appearing, and every feat will have a level on it. The way to think of a feat is a feat is essentially a class feature that doesn't belong to a single class. Mm. And just as class features have levels, feats are now going to have levels. That makes a lot of sense. And, and so there's a, there are several reasons for this. 
One, because we're really embracing feats in certain parts of this playtest process, backgrounds being one of, one of the main parts of the game where we're doing that, we want to make sure that feat selection is not overwhelming. And one way for us to make it so that it's not overwhelming is to break feats up into smaller groups. And one of those ways that we're doing that is with levels. So for instance, if something in the game tells you, go pick a first level feat, then you know immediately, well, then I can ignore all the feats. In well, one thing this definitely tells me is that we're going to probably see a lot more feats in 5.5 or the next version of 5th edition. Um, because if they're going to have feats that are leveled and breaking it up, um, obviously there's more to deal with. So uh, we're going to see more feats. They're going further into feats. Uh, I wasn't sure what they were going to do with feats, but it looks like they're going all in. In this book that are for 4th level, that are for 20th level, or any other level that might be on the feats. Instead, you can just focus in on the first level ones. And this allows those universal traits that don't belong to any specific class to... Now, I'm curious, does that mean there are going to be 20 levels of feats? Like, are they going to line up with your character level, or is it going to be like spell levels where they don't necessarily line up with your character level? Frankly, what I hope they do with spells is uh, change the level system so that either they do line up with your character level or they give them some other um, designation than level. Have a, a variance of power that feels like more in tune with your leveling up. Exactly. Like, like it allows you not to like, I'm just picking from the same pool of feats as I've always done. Like, no, this, you can get a feat that is much more uh, strong. Yeah. Well, not only that, but also something people are going to see is that when you examine the first level feats in this Unearthed Arcana, if you're familiar with the feats that have been in the game in the last eight years, some of them have, in addition to including some sort of uh, special benefit, have often also included a plus one to one of your ability scores. Right. You'll notice reading this document, none of these feats have a plus one to an ability score. And that's intentional because that is actually one of the signs that you're looking at a first level feat. Because when you see some of the higher level feats in our upcoming Unearthed Arcanas, some of those feats will still have a plus one to a particular ability score. But again, one of the signs of a first level feat is they don't include that. Uh, and because first level feats are not meant to change your ability score because when you're uh, building your character, there are already other things that are manipulating your ability scores. Right, that those initial factors. Whereas when you move forward and you start hitting other levels, you are faced with the, do I increase my ability stats or do I go with a feat? Right. And this kind of softens that as well. Just came to me uh, while I was thinking about this is that um, this might be the way that custom lineage uh, and variant human um, become balanced with the rest of the races is if you were to say that you get a custom lineage but you're going to get a first level feat and of course if none of them provide ability score bonuses that prevents that little exploit that custom lineage can do right now to get a starting 18 in the ability score when no other race is capable of doing that uh, so this might be a way to balance that out um, especially if the first level feats aren't quite as good of like, well, you're still getting a benefit with some of these feats. Well, you're not only getting a benefit, but it's a benefit your character didn't have before. Right. Uh, yeah. This is this is a pure addition that we're providing now for everybody, and we have that in mind as we decide what qualifies as a first level feat and what doesn't. Uh, basically, anything that's going to dramatically increase uh, character power in some way, people are not going to see as a first level feat. Uh, that, that is the domain of higher level feats, uh, where uh, the game's math can handle adjustments to raw power. Most first level feats are about increasing a character's versatility and speaking to different key backstories. Uh, and you'll see that these feats are, you know, they all are featured 
in at least one of the sample backgrounds in this document. So you can also see, looking at the sample backgrounds, how to match first level feats with background if you decide uh, to build your own background. Uh, and again, if you don't want to, you just grab one of these pre-made backgrounds and the background just feeds you a, a particular feat. Uh, for instance, if you, if you pick the sailor, you're going to get Tavern Brawler. And, <laughs> and the reason for that is because in the little story that we provide for the sailor, it's because on your, on your long journeys, you have spent a whole lot of time in taverns, you know, in different ports of call. Yeah. And, uh, and in the process, you've gotten really good at participating in brawls. Uh, Whereas and, like criminal, you get alert, I believe. Yes. Uh, because that makes sense. Yes, because you want to be very alert. <laughs> you got to look out for the, the, the soldiers of the crown or whatever. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, people are going to see that alert, which is a returning feat, has new functionality. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm super excited about this whole approach that we're taking with backgrounds. Of it's all about building character, your I mean, character's yeah. story, and making certain meaningful game mechanic choices that reflect the story you have in mind for your character. Uh, and each of the sample backgrounds that we provide are really there to inspire you, to show you the kinds of backstories that you can have for your character. So that's why you're gonna see, again, not only some returning backgrounds, uh, like soldier, like sailor, uh, uh, acolyte, but you're also gonna see brand new ones, like cultist, uh, pilgrim, uh, and a number of others, all meant to show a different aspect of of a character's life uh, that could have been formative in who they are. Yeah, and it's such a good, uh, it helps for a point of inspiration how you role play your character as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I like the meaningfulness of the backgrounds. Uh, like backgrounds were always cool before, but now it's like, okay, this is this has oomph. A lot of oomph. <laughs> it, has, it has a lot of oomph because its background is also where you can uh, express your character's culture, where your character is from, some of those elements that used to exist in some of our character races, those elements now exist in background. That migration of sort of cultural, culturally encoded elements migrating to background is a philosophy that informs a number of the design decisions in this particular UA. It's why, for instance, uh, to go back to one of our race options, if you look at the dwarf in this Unearthed Arcana, the dwarf does not have uh, mountain dwarf and hill dwarf as sub-options anymore. And there's a reason for that. It's because those options were only cultural for dwarves. Mm. Uh, in our D&D worlds, those are really cultural designations that different dwarf communities have taken on. Uh, and also in some D&D worlds, those names don't appear at all. Right, yeah. And unlike, say, elves, who actually have different mystical abilities based on their connections with different environments, you know, whether it's wood elves who have particular magical abilities because of their connection to primeval forests, or drow who have you know, their magical abilities because of the millennia they've spent in the magic-saturated Underdark. Dwarves don't have those associations. And so instead of having a choice which was, again, cultural, and culture now is reflected by background, we focused in on, let's make the dwarf the dwarfiest dwarf. And so in a few cases where maybe before there was an, there's an option that's not there anymore, really often the option is just moved someplace else. And so any of the cultural cues that a person before was searching for in, say, their dwarf character, they can now replicate those and often with more oomph in the background system. For instance, if you want to really lean into, you know, the, the fairy tale dwarf who 
not only has all the characteristics we expect of a dwarf, but you know, also is like a miner and some and you know this sort of thing, then I encourage people to go pick the laborer background where you're going to get all the stuff you would expect uh, for a, a character who's really leaning into that archetype. This all connects to Monsters of the Multiverse as well. Absolutely. So anything that you're seeing here is designed to play side by side with books you have already, and that includes recent books like Monsters of the Multiverse. So the dwarf, for instance, that uh, you see in this Unearthed Arcana is meant to exist in the game side by side with the Dwergar that appears in Monsters of the Multiverse. The elf in this UA is designed to stand side by side with the sea elf Aladrin and Shatter Kai who are in Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, same with gnomes where we have, we have the sort of the player's handbook gnome that we're looking at here uh -huh. and then we have the additional gnome option of the deep gnome in Monsters of the Multiverse. So really when you look at the player's handbook version of something, it is, that is the most sort of like archetypal right. universal version, the most common version that you're going to see. All of those other versions that we have, particularly in a book like Monsters of the Multiverse, which we designed to be a big collection of options that would then be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with the options in the new core rule books, you then, when you put them all together, have this amazing family of options. And these new options don't take away those, but instead, in many ways, create some, when you look at one and look at the other, it really then highlights even more what's special about each of the options. This play test material is meant to work and the future product, the future player's handbook, very nicely with the books that already exist. Exactly. Now, there's a lot we could say about the feats that you're getting from those backgrounds. Correct. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm really excited for people to read through all of them, to see what's going on in these feats, rather than going through each one of them, uh, as much as I would love to, because there's so many <laughs> there's cool- a, There's a lot to look at. There's yeah. so many fun things in these new feats. Really what I'd love to do is talk briefly about some of the philosophy behind the decision-making here. Uh, I've already talked a bit about uh, some of the things that distinguish a first level feat from higher level feats. Uh, there's another thing uh, that informs some of the decisions we made about the feats here, and that is, First, I'll talk about feats we revised, and then I'll also talk about brand new feats. Mm -hmm. So whenever we were revising a feat that already existed in the 2014 Player's Handbook and made the determination that it was going to become a first level feat, we not only wanted to make sure it was delivering something with very clear functionality and clear value we also wanted to make sure that the feat is useful to the people who most archetypally would want to take it. Here's what I mean by that. If you look at the healer feat in the 2014 Player's Handbook, you read the title and you think, hey, I'm playing a, a life cleric, I'm a healer. Right. That's probably a feat I want to take. But then if you read it... Not the, very beneficial. No, because that feat was actually written for a person who maybe doesn't have any healing ability. Right. So we have kind of uh, turned that on its head. Uh, and we have now made it so that this feat is beneficial to people who are already healers while also providing right. a healing ability to somebody who lacks it. So that's the kind of the needle we're threading in a lot of these that maybe a feat that before seemed to be calling to a particular type of character, but then didn't connect with that character at all. We have now made it so that it is beneficial for that kind of character. Like many life clerics are now going to want to take the healer feat. Um, but then also many non spellcasting characters, I think might be drawn to the healer feat uh, because of their character's back backstory. 
because of the battle medic ability right. uh, that is now in the healer feat that allows you to actually heal somebody uh, using a healer's kit. And you'll see that again and again in these feats. Uh, things that are either going to be beneficial for the individual character who we expect would be attracted to the feat or beneficial to the whole party. Here's an example of that. In the alert feat, now first level feat uh, that, again, the criminal has, not only do you get a bonus to your initiative roll, but you also now have an ability when initiative is rolled, you and another member of your party can swap initiative. Which is amazing. Oh, I love it. That's really and, interesting. And, and this that ability alone like that. is going to make many groups like, oh, we are so happy if somebody has alert. Because we have all playing DD been in that situation where like, if only this particular character was able to go earlier. Exactly, yeah. And and so now the character who is because this alert feed is designed to mean this is the person who is exceptionally ready to jump into action and can help one of their buddies do so. And, uh, and that's another, yeah, that's another example of like alert was a very like for my character only feat. Right. <laughs> right. Like, like I just want to be first. Right. Now you have the option to like pass that on to someone else in your group and be a good party member. Exactly. Uh, if given the option. But yeah, yeah like that's, that's lovely. That that dual purpose for all these feats. Yeah, that's and nice. then and and then the brand new feats are designed to fill some character type gaps that existed before. Gaps that really came to mind for us as we were designing the sample backgrounds. What's an example of one of the new feats? Uh, so musician right. is, oh, there, yeah, is, is one of the new feats. And with the musician feat, you can not only gain proficiency with three musical instruments of your choice, and sort of getting three tool proficiencies used to be a function, one of the optional functions of the skilled feat, but now you get a more flavorful version of that, not only in the musician feat, but also elsewhere. Uh, so you get to choose. Th now, there was nobody taking the skilled feat and then taking three instruments with it. <laughs> three musical instruments that you're proficient with. But then you also have the ability that whenever you finish a short or long rest, you can give inspiration to a number of people who hear you play a song on one of your instruments. Uh, and the number of people who can gain inspiration is affected by your proficiency bonus. So. In other words, the higher level you get, it scales rather more, nicely. Yeah. And and so, you know, in any group, we're like, gosh, we'd really love to have sort of inspiration in our pocket, ready to go. And for anyone watching who doesn't know what inspiration is, because a lot of groups don't use it, that's essentially having um, advantage in your pocket, ready to use when you need it. Right. Uh, if it's available through so a feat, a lot a more with the groups are going feet, to start using, using it. This I guess inspiring song can give people inspiration. So this brand new feat is not only filling a gap in our previous feat list, but it's also doing exactly what I was talking about earlier about the healer feat, and that is it will be useful to also someone who's already a musician, right. most, most notably the bard. The bard, yeah. Because this ability to, whenever you finish a rest, to give certain number of people of inspiration is not an ability the bard has. So this combines really nicely with a bard's kit. Yeah. So uh, you can become the most bardy bard, or you can play a, a fighter who also on occasion takes out a loot. Yeah, who before battle plays this beautiful song and everyone is like, mm, now I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, and, and, and again, that is the philosophy here throughout, is how can we make uh, people who, again, want a taste of something they don't have happy, but then also make the people who already have the thing also happy. Magic Initiate does this too. Magic Initiate, like some of the feats we've published in the past year or two, now tells you, hey, not only do you get some spells that you can cast for free, uh, but if you already have spell slots, 
you can use them to cast Great. these spells too. And we, and we, we saw Great. this in the evolution of like Tasha's and other books where... That... I mean, we knew that was coming, right? That Magic Initiate was going to be changed so you could use your spell slots, uh, even if you weren't a member of that class already. Uh, but glad to hear it confirmed. Uh, you you very key, much keyed into the fact of like, yeah, I got this first level spell, but like I can't upcast it with Magic Initiate. Right. So it's a little like frustrating if that scale if that spell can scale up if you like use a higher spell slot um, and now or if you, you want to cast that. it yeah. more than if once you want to hellish rebuke someone which right. i love doing uh <laughs> you can do so now the feat also uh has been given broader functionality because people are going to see uh in this feat a reference to something that is new yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about. Well, I assume you're talking about spells and how they're defined. Yes. So, not only does the Magic Initiate feat uh, refer to what we're. Oh, please, please. Spell level designations be changed. We're about to talk about, but there, there are references to it uh, elsewhere in the doc, one of those being in the High Elf. And that is, we now refer to three new spell lists. There is an arcane spell list, a divine spell list, and a primal spell list. In our work over the last few years, as we've been preparing to start unveiling this material, we realized that as the game expands, as there are new subclass options, uh, also with you know, the introduction of a class like the Artificer, uh, with feats, with magic items, with a variety of things that give you access to spells, there has been a growing need for us to have a new type of spell list, and that is a spell list that isn't tied to a particular class, but is instead tied to really the source of your magic. Right. Um, and so in this case, arcane spells are all about manipulating the background magic that's in the entire multiverse. Divine spells, uh, as people would expect, come from either gods or the realms of the gods. Uh, and then primal spells are about drawing on the magic that is in uh, not only sort of the elements, but also in the spirits of nature. Uh, and the way, the way we sort of divide it is Divine is really magic pulling from the outer planes. Primal is pulling from the inner planes. And arcane is pulling from sort of the multiverse uh, writ large. And so now, rather than us directing you for certain spell choices in particular contexts, like you know the previous magic initiate was like, all right, go pick from the spell list of one of these particular classes, which then suddenly, the moment we introduce a new class like Artificer, <laughs> right? <laughs> th then, then we need a whole new feat for that. Yeah. This feat now grows with the future of the game because now, any time that we introduce a spell, the spell itself will have for you a tag that tells you if it's arcane, divine, or primal, or a mix, because of some spells, as people are gonna see in some of our upcoming Unearthed Arcana, fall into multiple categories, this is gonna have a tremendous payoff, not only for like, oh, this later supplement added a new arcane spell, I have access uh, to the arcane spell list, I can now have access to that so what it sounds like, he's talked about an additional designation, but it sounds like uh, the way he's talking that uh, instead of an additional designation, it's a different designation. So um, instead of having a cleric spell list and a druid spell list and a wizard spell list and a sorcerer spell list, we'll have three spell lists. That's what it sounds like to me. Spell without it having to route through a particular class. Uh, a much more elegant solution. <laughs> yes, and it it also is another. Uh, it has another purpose for us. It's a way for us to take this notion of these sources of magic, which are mentioned at least arcane and divine are, in the 2014 player's handbook, 
but now we actually sort of give them rules teeth. Rather than just sort of being a story wrapper, because arcane and divine and then occasionally primal when it has been mentioned have really just been a flavor wrapper, now they actually have substance in the game itself. That there is a list that you can go look at and go, here are the sort of universal arcane spells. Here are the universal divine spells and so on. Now, people will have to wait for upcoming Unearthed Arcanas to see how classes use those lists because classes are going to use those lists, but classes are also going to have access to spells that uh, go beyond those universal lists. Okay, so I was partially right. Uh, so they're going to have uh, the ability to access one of those kinds, and then it says partial lists, so maybe there's like specific spells available to certain classes, um, but kind of a combination, I guess. Uh, but again, that's for, that's for future us to talk about. Uh, and, but again, I think, I think already this is super exciting, uh, yeah, being no. able to reveal um, these, again, these new types of spell lists that provide a tremendous amount of flexibility for characters, not only that will be able to be made with this series of Unearthed Arcana articles, but also that will be able to be made in the future. Yeah, it is a very exciting time. Uh, this is a very weighty UA. We're going to be doing this often this year. <laughs> uh, uh, somewhat semi-monthly, but yeah, not, not necessarily not necessarily strictly defined yeah. in terms of timing, but we have a lot of UAs coming out this year. We need a lot of player feedback. So. And, and there is so much in this UA that we could talk about. Yes, and I know. We, do, we, 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 <laughs> we, we, be, we could have gone through everything and we could have made this a three-hour video. And, uh, and there are, before we sign off on this video, yeah. there are a couple other gems in this UA I, I would love to Go highlight. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I am I'm eager to hear. So first, I encourage people in the rules glossary to look at not only the revised definitions of a couple of our conditions, they're also going to see there's a new condition that's in play, the slowed condition, and people are going to see in the upcoming Unearthed Arcanas uh, updates to a number of the game's conditions, so I'm excited to see what people think about that. Also, I encourage people to take a look at the new rules for inspiration because we've decided that uh, rather than inspiration being connected to essentially just the DM awarding people for particular character choices, instead, inspiration is going to be something you can reliably get whenever you roll a 20 on an ability check, cool. saving throw, or attack roll. I like that. We wanted a way to feed people inspiration through the system itself. And we love this idea of when you have a spectacular success, you're inspired by you're it. You're bolstered by it. You're bolstered by it, and that can start creating this sort of snowball oh, effect. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we're going for. We've also uh, tweaked the rule on inspiration so that it's still the same that you can only ever have one instant of, of inspiration. You don't get to stockpile inspiration. So you either have it or you don't. <laughs> but we've now made it so that if something in the game gives you inspiration and you already have it, you can then immediately give it to one of the other characters in your group. I oh, like that fantastic. too. Uh, and it's likely that people are going to have it because you get it by rolling a 20. And one of the new traits of humans in the game is humans, whenever they finish a long rest, have inspiration. So every human in your group is going to start every adventuring day with inspiration. And that uh, that doesn't excite me all that much because it sounds kind of like inspiration is pretty cheap, right? Uh, he's already talked about uh, a first level feat where you can give inspiration to multiple members of your party, scaling with your level. He's talked about getting inspiration whenever you roll a 20. And I mean, often uh, players can do things to make uh, like... You can say, hey, can I use my religion uh, skill to determine what this creature is or uh, what that um, or what that symbol is? And 
so often players will kind of ask to make a skill roll on something and you know you're going to investigate every door and you, you're going to be able to get inspiration pretty easy it sounds like that means then if the human gets inspiration and already has it they can then give inspiration to somebody else i think there's going to be a really fun sort of you know inspiration flowing around yeah. uh, in the party and what people are going to see as they actually experience this in play what the system is intentionally doing is encouraging you to use the inspiration because there's more is coming. Yeah. Uh, Instead of just like greedily, you know, yeah. like, I don't know what I'm going to need this. <laughs> exactly. And it's, yeah. we, we, we often, when we're assessing different parts of the system, uh, if we see something that ends up getting hoarded so much that it actually almost never sees use, yeah. that to us tells we need to change something so that this actually becomes a fun part of play and not something that just gets marked on your character sheet and then you forget about is it. Is this the moment that I use it? That that, that kind of uh, almost anxiety? Like, right. I, like I've been in so many, you and I have been in so many one shots where it's like, well, I never used it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's gone forever. Whereas we want to make it easy for people to say yes. Yeah. To say, yes, I'm going to use my inspiration. Uh, because it's likely more is coming right around the corner. The getting a natural twenty thing is so exciting because, like you, that's such a cinematic moment or a, like a, nar a great narrative moment of like I, I've been very successful and now I have a little bit left over and that could you could roll another twenty. It could yeah. keep going and going and yeah. going and and to see a game where like something like that happens. I mean the the odd. I yeah. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think I've got mixed feelings about how they're handling inspiration in natural 20s uh, because I'm just thinking like I guess I better start investigating every single door and uh, every single room uh, you know even if it's slowing things down because then I get to make more rolls and the more rolls I make the more inspiration I'm going to have and make sure that the whole group has got inspiration and then we move on right because you can there's so many ways you can create your own skill checks um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that we'll have to see. I'll have to play with it, and and I guess this is a play test. This is our chance to determine if that way of handling inspiration is, is bogging things down. I think there's, at least in some groups, it depends who you play with and the style of play, of course. Um, but with some groups, if they're really trying to get the most inspiration they can, there's ways they can do it, and I'm not sure they're fun. We'll see. We'll see. Clubs are, are are not high, but they're higher now <laughs> to see something that kind of amazing at the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, yeah. very fun. So critical hits have changed as well. Can you elaborate on, on that? We are experimenting in this Unearthed Arcana with a new take on the critical hit. So in addition to rolling a 20, now feeding you inspiration, whether it's an ability check, saving throw, or attack roll, we've now specified that if it's an attack roll and you roll a 20, it's also a critical hit as you would expect. But what's different here is it's only a critical hit if you were attacking with a weapon or an unarmed strike. Now in most cases in our game, that was already the case in actual play. So spells can no longer critical hit is what he's saying. Um, so no critical hit fire bolts or uh, Eldritch Blast or whatever. Um, I wonder why. Uh, because most spells in the game trigger saving throws rather than involving an attack roll. Spells scoring critical hits uh, was a more sort of rare occurrence than weapons scoring them. But we're exploring this option, and again, I really want to emphasize, this is a great example of a playtest giving us the chance to experiment with something. Yeah, remember, this is not set in stone. <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> This right. is playtest. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we, we want to see what does the community think and how does this play out for them? Because what we're really trying to do is carve out a clearer space for essentially spell operations on one side and weapon and unarmed strike operations on the other. And the critical hit was already uh, confusing for a number of people 
because I've actually lost count over the last eight years the number of times I've been asked by the community, can spells score a critical hit? So funnily, this, this uh, experiment in this UA will function for many groups the way they were already playing because many groups had doubt that spells could actually critical even though they could. Right. And so now we're experimenting with, well, just what if they can't? Uh, and this is a function of weapon use and unarmed strike use which then also allows for us to do greater clarity because then it's there's not that fuzziness before of like take the dice that were involved in the attack and roll them twice. No, now we zoom way in. It's take the weapon or the unarmed strikes dice and roll them a second time. Now, of course, people know that some people don't have dice for their unarmed strikes, but monks and others absolutely do. And we wanted to make sure this critical hit option was available for them, in addition to characters who rely more on weapons. Now, there's an additional nuance here. The way we have worded this experimental rule, it is only player characters who score critical hits. Okay, so uh, it sounds that's a big deal. The monsters not being able to score critical hits anymore. Um, and frankly, my gut instinct is that's a good move. Um, there were getting to be too many ways that uh, player characters could foil critical hits. Though I will say that the Grave Cleric just got screwed, right? Uh, if the 5.5 uh, is supposed to be backwards compatible, um, if, if there's no crits for the Grave Cleric to nullify, then they have a feature that does nothing. Um, but in general, I find, especially at low-level play, monsters scoring critical hits can be um, character-ending, right? Uh, sometimes they do so much damage, they can absolutely drop even insta-kill a player character. So getting rid of that is probably a good thing. And then it's going to get rid of all the, you know, the monster score to critical. Now we have to go through the characters casting silvery barbs or using the grave cleric feature or uh other ways they might have the monster re-roll luck it comes into play um so maybe it's just as easy not to have them score criticals now the question i would ask is is a 20 still an automatic hit for a monster i wonder if he's going to answer that now i need to unpack that well it's kind <laughs> it's, so first uh Critical hits for monsters often play out in uh, strange, unsatisfying, or terrifying ways, and I'll unpack, I'll unpack those. First, they can be terrifying. Higher level, terrifying is fine. First level, terrifying can mean the character's gone. Uh, so crits are extremely dangerous at low levels for player characters. You know, that bugbear critting your first level character might mean That's it. your character is on, on, its, on their way to the grave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but then other times, because of how a monster's damage expression is built, a monster critical hit can feel unsatisfying. Uh, uh, and the DM might say there was a crit, but the math doesn't really deliver the punch that you you were expecting when the DM said that. Also, because a lot of DMs use static damage, our crit rule where you're rolling a die a second time, there's friction between yeah. that rule and how monsters are actually designed. And then there's a further reason that we're experimenting with this, and that is monsters actually already have their own built-in crit-like mechanic and that is the recharge mechanic. We use recharge abilities to deliver those scary, massive strikes. Right. Think of the dragon's breath weapon. When that happens, everyone is put on notice and that is the scary moment. The DM decides when to use it. So the DM can make an informed decision when to crank up the difficulty in a battle. The DM has no control over a critical hit. Now, uncertainty is also fun because we like DMs being surprised, but that's where the recharge roll comes in because the DM, once the DM decides to essentially press the 
things are going to get real yeah, button. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they get the button back. <laughs> they're not sure when they get the button back. Yeah, yeah. And so there is already this element of uncertainty purposefully built into the recharge mechanic. And so what we're exploring is this notion. I think comparing recharge and criticals is, is a bit of a stretch, honestly. Uh, first off, a lot of monsters don't have recharge features, uh, unless that's going to change. But we have Monsters of the Multiverse, and there's lots of creatures without recharge features. Um, and also, I mean, it's not really the same thing. A uh, critical hit and using a recharge feature can be very, just very, very different. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I guess I get what he's going getting at here, but it's kind of a, a stretch an analogy, I think. ...of really monsters don't need crits because they have crits in another form and that is in recharge abilities and those the dm has a bit more control over even though it's not total control because again once used the dm doesn't know when it's coming back uh that is that that modicum of control is more in keeping with what we expect for a dungeon master and so we're exploring the crit as it's a, essentially a special ability of player characters, of occasionally they score these surprisingly good hits that deal more damage than uh, the weapon or unarmed strike would normally deal. Uh, this is this is a rule I, I am very keen to get feedback on and hope people will try it out in their game. Uh, and then we'll see where we go next once, once we get the feedback on it. Related to rolling the d20, there's also another significant thing in the rules glossary that... I just want to stop one second there. It sounds like he's moved on from critical hits. Uh, so he didn't say anything about the mechanics of a critical hit changing. Uh, so normally a critical hit, you just get an additional die for each die you would have rolled as part of the damage. Um, and a lot of groups house rule it because critical hits especially it depends on the weapon but you know you have a d6 weapon and you're adding a big modifier on top and then you score a critical hit critical hit doesn't really feel very special like it might only add a point or two of damage um, to what was a huge amount of damage so it becomes almost insignificant in fact i see all the time where people score uh, they do a series of attacks and then one of them is a critical hit and it's actually doing less damage than their regular hits because uh, had a couple die rolls and they just weren't all that high um and it sounds like they're not changing that mechanic. Uh, and I kind of figured they would. That's a bit of a surprise, uh, though there's still time for them to change it again. This is just a play test. Uh, I encourage people to take a look at, and that is we have decided to embrace how many groups actually play. <laughs> and that is when you roll a one or a 20 for an ability check, saving throw or attack roll. Right. A 1 is an automatic failure and a 20 is an automatic success. It will surprise some people watching that that's a change because... I, yeah, I know. That is a common misconception in the game that uh, ability checks as the rules are now. Uh, 20 is not an automatic success and a 1 is not an automatic failure. Though, technically speaking, why did the DM ask for the check in the first place? If it was automatically going to succeed or automatically going to fail, it's kind of wasting our time. Um, unless they're trying to get that, you know, that 20 to get, uh, no, but anyway, um, also that's the case with, uh, saving throws. 20 doesn't automatically save and a one doesn't automatically fail. In fact, all the time I tell people not to bother rolling. Like there'll be a concentration check. They have a plus nine on their constitution score or, or the constitution saving throw modifier. Um, and they have a DC of 10. So don't bother rolling, right? Uh, no point. He's saying now there's a point because a one is going to fail. Because I've been doing it, I don't know, for like 10 years. Yes. <laughs> at least. Uh, because for, yeah, anyone who might yeah. not know, previously a 20 meeting an automatic success and a one meeting an automatic failure was only a function of the attack roll. Right. Not of ability checks and saving throws. But what we have seen over the last eight years is more... Oh. And uh, I mentioned before, if monsters can't crit, is a 20 even going to hit automatically? Sounds like yes, 20 is still going to hit automatically. More and more groups use that rule for all of the D20 tests. 
and we decided rather than having the rules being in friction with how people actually play the game, let's update the rules so that the game plays the way people expect it to. Well, that's what's so much of what is in this first playtest material is much of that. Yes. Uh, of how people actually play or and want to play. Be because we, over the last eight years, through the many uh, surveys that people have filled out that have been valuable to our work, we've been listening. We've been paying attention. We watch streamed games. We constantly play D&D. &D, and all of that feedback, all of that play, all of that observation has fed into what people are seeing in this Unearthed Arcana and what they're going to see in the months ahead. There, there's two sides of the playtest material. Like this is a moment in time where like all of everyone's feedback has led to this playtest material. And your feedback after this <laughs> is going to lead to the final version. So be sure to play test. Absolutely. Because this is not the final version. It, everything here is subject to change. Uh, this is really, this UA in particular is our hello. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hello, and, we're listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the feedback that then the community provides in response will help determine what parts of this make it into the new core books, what parts do we set to the side, and what parts do we keep but change. And so what everyone is going to see, just like with the D&D Next process almost 10 years ago, you're going to see an evolution uh, in these playtest materials, uh, in the game itself. Also, the exciting thing, I think, for everyone is you're going to be able to use all of these playtest docs with your existing core books. We have designed these docs so that you can take each one, and other than the places where we tell you, all right, you know that thing in your book? Well, here's, here's an update to it. Otherwise, all this material works with the core books you already have, meaning, uh, the UAs that are ahead will be very targeted rather than it being like, here is a cross section of the, of the entire game. Right. Instead, we're going to drill into one piece because that piece will now work with the books you have already. Uh, and so that's why, you know, in, in coming ones, we're going to drill deep on particular classes and then eventually we'll drill deep on particular spells uh, as we build this, it's almost like we're building a mosaic uh, that in the end, you know, once all the pieces are in place, you will get a glimpse of what the new core books are going to look like. This has to be very exciting for you. Like beyond the rules and the play test, this is like a very exciting time to be a D&D fan. Yeah. And to be making D&D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's wonderfully exciting uh, because we're able. I, I would agree with that. This is some week for D&D &D, uh, because... Tuesday, Spelljammer came out. Uh, we've got this new Unearthed Arcana uh, with the Origins. Um, and uh, there was a uh, Wizards Announce today uh, live stream where they talked about how um, they're going, I think they call it 1D&D. &D, and it's basically combining D&D Beyond with the core books and um, what is essentially going to be a virtual tabletop that is uh, going to be um, using the Unreal Engine and, uh, you know, the sample graphics they showed look really, really good. Um, we'll see, we'll see, uh, what the final product looks like. That's still in development, but, uh, that is apparently in development right now. So we're going to have virtual tabletop right on, uh, D&D &D Beyond, um, which I mean, me personally, I use D&D &D Beyond all the time and then I use it with other virtual tabletops that might stop. I might just use D&D &D Beyond in the future. Uh, so yeah, huge week for D&D. &D. Um, and it also makes me think like Spelljammer is thin, right? There just isn't a whole lot of content in there. Um, it, it seems like it was a little bit phoned in. And it, I kind of wonder, like someone like Jeremy Crawford, is he just, his, his inbox is just so high up that, uh, you know, player's handbook and uh we're talking about one D D and oh yeah i've got this book that they did designers ah it's fine send it out right <laughs> i wonder if that's what's going on 
able to take something that we love, feed the passion that we in the community have had for it over the last eight years, feed all the conversations we've had internally that we've had with fans out in the world, and take all of that and let it flow into the game itself so that it can move now into its, its next generation. That's perfect. I am excited for, I'm very excited for this video and for many more. All right. So I think that pretty much ties it up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I haven't looked at this Unearthed Arcana yet uh, because it is not available for another hour and 17 minutes. Uh, and I'm counting down the minutes because I will absolutely be, normally I don't look at Unearthed Arcana very much. This player's handbook stuff. Yeah, I'm in and I will be covering it in videos. We'll, we'll, after after I've had a chance to read through it and and get some some impressions, then I'm going to start doing videos and I'll do videos probably on all of them right up to the release of the new player's handbook. Hope you'll join me. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D and D is for everyone. Thanks everybody. Talk to you soon.